Hey everyone, we're Nick and Rachel. If you're new here and haven't been following our adventures over the past year, you'll typically find us vlogging our travels around the world. However, this series of videos is going to be a little bit different and the reason that we're creating them is because as we've gone from country to country, we've noticed that there are a few things that are a little bit different in each of these countries in comparison to the UK and Canada. The reason that we have this channel is to share our travel experiences in the hopes of inspiring others to travel more. With that, we want to share some tips and tricks that we've picked up in each of the countries that we've visited so that if you want to go to the same places, you'll be armed with some helpful information and knowledge to make planning and navigating around a little bit easier. Today's video is going to be focused on traveling around New Zealand. If you've been following our adventures through New Zealand, then you'll know that we went to Waitemo, Taupo, including the Tongariro Alpine Crossing, Rotorua, Lake Te Kapo, Wanaka, Te Arnau, including Milford Sound, Franz Josef and Fox Glaciers, Mount Cook, Kaikoura, Blenheim, and Auckland. While a number of these pointers are going to be about these specific places, the rest of them will be about the country as a whole. We hope that you find them useful. Obviously, depending on what passport you hold, the visa and visa waiver requirements will be different. For us as British citizens, but I believe it was the same for Canadians as well, we needed to apply for an ETA, which is a visa waiver, up to 72 hours before our flight to New Zealand. The ETA was 25 New Zealand dollars per person. When you apply and pay for your ETA, you will incur an additional environmental charge that is 38 New Zealand dollars per person. Once you have the ETA, it should last you two years, but you just need to bear in mind that it does cost money to get. I do think that the majority of passport holders have to go through a similar process, but it is definitely worth researching before you go to New Zealand to see what the requirements are for your passport and be prepared for additional charges. In addition to this, then you will also need to produce a landing card prior to your arrival in New Zealand. These will be freely handed out to you while you're on the plane, but if you are also lucky enough to have some internet connectivity before you go, then there is an official government website where you can also complete this arrival card ahead of time, so it is just on your phone. Either way though, thankfully the arrival card costs no additional charge, it's just something you have to fill out to make sure that you are complying with their environmental entry requirements. Public transportation is practically non-existent outside of the major cities. Therefore, the only way to really get around the country is by renting a car or camper van so that you can explore independently, or you could take internal flights depending on what your budget is. The road surfaces in New Zealand are generally very, very good, and certainly we didn't really encounter many problems as we were driving through the country. However, it is worth noting that in most instances, it's usually just going one lane each way, even if it says it's a national highway. So therefore, you might find yourself caught behind slower moving traffic for some time during your journeys. Equally, due to the landscape of New Zealand, which is predominantly mountains, lakes and valleys, then you might find yourself going through some very, very winding roads, which will also end up slowing you down. Therefore, however long Google Maps says that your journey is going to take, then it's probably best to tack on an additional 20% or so, because Google Maps itineraries are based on the premise that you're going to be going at the top speed limit for the entire journey, which definitely you are not going to do. So it's best just to make sure that you add that extra time so that you're not unexpectedly late to anywhere you want to go. Nick alluded to New Zealand's landscape, which includes many mountains, valleys, and lakes, all of which obstruct the roads. It's worth planning your entire itinerary and tentatively planning the best route so you don't end up doubling back on yourself and having to drive double the distance. The reason for this is that New Zealand just doesn't have many major roads because of its landscape. It's not like in North America and in Europe where roads connect in all directions. In New Zealand, there may be only one way to access certain tourist attractions and you may have to exit the same way that you came. 
It's just due to the nature of New Zealand's topography that limits and restricts where roads can be built, meaning that there are fewer major roads connecting the places that you're gonna want to go. So just do a lot of planning in advance to make sure that you create the most efficient itinerary for yourself. Because of the lack of need for a huge road network, because it is so sparsely populated, then you will notice as you drive through New Zealand that there is a lot of seemingly barren land as you drive through. It's not like in Europe or Canada where generally speaking, even if you're going through a more rural area that there's just gonna be houses dotted around every single time, you will find that you could be driving for tens or potentially even hundreds of kilometers without seeing a single human soul there. So do expect that. The reason that we're telling you this is because this also means that infrastructure can also be a little bit fewer and further between than you can expect. So with that, then it is worth making sure that you have provisioned appropriately for appropriate rest stops, refueling your petrol, and also making sure that you have enough food as you go about your travels through the country. We visited New Zealand during their summer and we were surprised by the weather given that it was their summer. Particularly in the South Island, some of the places we visited were far cooler and wetter than we thought it would be. So just be prepared for inclement weather, whether it's cooler weather, wetter weather, and also sunny and hot weather because it can change pretty quickly and you need to be prepared for it even if it's the summer. One of the main differences between Australia and New Zealand is actually the differences in the type of wildlife that you can expect to see. While Australia is known for its adorable mammals, particularly the likes of kangaroos and wombats and all of that kind of thing, mammals were not actually introduced to New Zealand until about 900 years ago. Up until that point, the native species of vertebrates that you could encounter on the land were birds. However, because of the introduction of mammal species, then unfortunately a lot of them have been hunted to near extinction. So with that, then the most likely way that you're going to see native birds in most parts of New Zealand, and we're talking especially about the national bird, the kiwi, among a couple of other ones, is to see them in sanctuaries and zoos. It is a sad state of affairs. The New Zealand government are trying to do something about it now to make sure that these birds can be bred back into the wild. But for now, that will be one of the only ways that you'll get to see these beautiful birds. However, that said, especially if you're going around South Island, you may end up spotting what looks like a gigantic green parrot. That is called a kia. They are a little bit mischievous, but they are wonderful things to see, and we ended up being lucky enough to see a few of them along our travels as well. You may end up getting lucky with a few of them, but obviously the native birds are a bit fewer and further between to see, so you will have to go out to those places. In the cases of kiwis, then they are kept in very specifically dark environments. This is because they are nocturnal birds. Any noise or light sources will stress them out, especially when it comes to breeding. With that, then if you do go to a kiwi sanctuary anywhere, then do not be surprised if you're not allowed to take photos or videos as you visit. Do adhere to this because if you do try and break the rules, then it is very possible that that sanctuary may lose their licensing and they won't be able to help get these species back on the New Zealand map anymore. So do heed the warnings and be respectful of the wildlife that you do get to see. Another difference between Australia and New Zealand is that New Zealand's national parks do not have any entry fees, which means that you can park there for free, which is great for any budget travelers. With New Zealand, then as you can probably imagine, then it does have a lot of the same types of amenities that we are used to in the UK and Canada. And that extends to drinking water and pretty much everything else. What that also manages to extend to is the cost of food. And this is something that we found as we explored the country. Eating out is very comparable to what you would expect in the likes of North America and Europe. And the same thing happens with groceries as well. So that is definitely something to bear in mind. We didn't really eat out a lot. We did end up going to a couple of bakeries where we were able to try some of New Zealand's very famous pies. And that is actually a very good way to get yourself something really nice for lunch. 
or dinner or any other time of the day where you just fancy having a pie. And when we say pies, we mean with savoury flavourings inside them. Typically we are talking about meat or vegetable pies. We're not really talking about more of the dessert pies that you might be accustomed to in North America. Just wanted to make that distinction very clear. Aside from this though, there are a couple of other New Zealand staples and we are talking about the likes of Hokey Pokey ice cream, which is made with honeycomb and is absolutely delicious. And the other thing that you do need to look out for is Whitaker's chocolate. It is just a wonderful thing and you should definitely look out for it whenever you're in any kind of grocery store. Wine prices in New Zealand are very comparable to what you would find in Canada. However, the price of beer is far more expensive because you'll find that a can of beer costs about the same as an entire bottle of wine. Now, what type of wine do we recommend you try in New Zealand? They are most famous for their Sauvignon Blanc and we can confirm it is really really good quality however we did sample some pinot noir as well as some sparkling wine which was made in the traditional method and we can confirm that all of it was fantastic so you really can't go wrong if you decide to go wine tasting in New Zealand upon arrival in New Zealand then one of the things that you are going to notice is that it really prides itself on being a filming location for a lot of things probably the most famous thing that it was the film set for was the Lord of the Rings and Hobbit movies. Based on that then it's a very logical step to want to visit New Zealand to go to Hobbiton which is one of the major filming sets for these series of films. I am a fan anyway, Rachel was not, but the greatest news was that we ended up going and we both had a truly wonderful time anyway. And I think we would extend that to anybody. If you have any kind of appreciation of art, filmmaking, or just attention to detail or anything like that, even if you're not necessarily big on high fantasy, then it is 100% worth going. The guides are amazing. They bring a wonderful energy and humor to everything. The place is packed with all sorts of little nuggets that you can really enjoy. And to top it all off, you get a free pint in the pub in which some of the films are set anyway. So why wouldn't you want to go? When most people go to Lake Taupo, I think that they visit the waterfalls for which the area is most known. However, we would also recommend visiting Aratea Tia Rapids. The rapids are created by the opening of a dam and it's absolutely incredible to see this dry, rocky valley become a flowing set of rapids in a very short amount of time. And then if you wait around long enough, to see it return to its original state of just a rocky valley. You can find the scheduled times at which the dam opens online and the whole event usually lasts about 10 to 30 minutes on average. But we'd recommend getting there early so that you can secure a good spot to watch this all happen. There are three different viewpoints that you can watch all of this take place. We recommend starting at the bridge and then very soon after the dam opens, moving to the first viewpoint as it is maybe at most a two to five minute walk away and watching the rest of the event happen from there. One of the major highlights and probably one of the biggest challenges that we took on our year of travel was going through the Tongariro Alpine Crossing, which is an epic trail that takes you around and through various volcanic craters and around a very long and winding trail that gives you some of the most breathtaking views that you can find on North Island. However, if you want to do this, it is 100% worth making sure that you check on the weather reports as frequently as possible. Then the reason for this is because the weather can change on a dime and if it is bad enough, then it is quite possible that they end up just closing the park altogether and it will mean that you will not be able to get up there on the day that you want to. The reason that we're telling you this is because really for the sake of making your crossing as easy as possible, it is definitely worth making sure that you arrange transportation ahead of you starting the crossing. That transportation does take you to the start of the trailhead so you can begin everything. However, 
it does have a cancellation policy that states that 48 hours ahead of you taking that shuttle, you will not get your money back. So therefore, it's very important that you keep an eye on it just in case there is any kind of chance of the park closing down on the day that you're planning on going as obviously you may end up losing money unexpectedly and we don't want that for anybody. The other reason that we're recommending that you take that transportation is because that then means that you leave your car at the car park and that car park is only about a kilometer away from the end of the trail so it makes it very easy for you to get back to your car. In terms of the actual crossing itself, we strongly suggest that you go with multiple layers as the weather will change with each set of elevation and each phase of the crossing as you go. And obviously be sure to take plenty of food and water. However much you're planning on taking, it's probably still not enough. The other reason that we're saying that it's better to go from the official trailhead is because actually that starts about 300 meters above the end of the trail. So in terms of the elevation gain and everything like that, it is much gentler if you do the route with the official start and end of the trail rather than trying to do it in reverse. One of the main reasons that people go to Rotorua is to see the redwood trees. And we were really pleased to discover that you can walk through the redwood forest for free. So again, this is another free activity for any of the budget conscious travelers out there. Obviously, when you are exploring through New Zealand, there are certain places which are renowned for their natural beauty as a point of interest. Around those, you will probably notice that there is a nearby town or village that has been set up for the purposes of tourism around those places. However, as I'm sure you can probably gather, a lot of these are quite expensive to stay in. So it may actually be better value for money and more in your interests as a budget conscious traveler to stay somewhere that's maybe 45 minutes to an hour outside of the place that you want to go and see for the purposes of getting cheaper accommodation. If you have a car, then it's probably not gonna matter much anyway, and it does mean that you get to see a little bit more of the country as well. Some of the examples of these would be the likes of Lake Takapo and Kaikoura, but we would probably go as far as to say that that is probably the best strategy for the entirety of New Zealand. Remember how earlier in the video we were talking about how there are not a lot of major roads in New Zealand and that not all of the largest tourist attractions are connected to one another via roads and you may have to like double back on yourself? Well, accessing Mount Cook is one of those situations. If you look on a map, it looks like you can access it from either Lake Takapo or Franz Josef and Fox Glaciers, but that's not the case. You need to access Mount Cook from Lake Takapo. Otherwise, you'll be like us and go to Franz Josef and Fox Glacier and then have to drive six hours back on yourself to go to Mount Cook, which just wastes your own time as well as money on gas. This is why we cannot stress highly enough how important it is to plan your itinerary before you go and make sure that you are driving the most efficient route for everything that you want to see. Adding on to this, then it is worth noting that if you want to see Milford Sound, then the closest large town and most cost-effective option to go and see it is to stay in Te Arnau. Because there is only one road that gets you in and out of Milford Sound and Te Arnau is on that road anyway, then it actually ends up probably being the most efficient way and cost-effective way to make sure that you get to see this amazing site. Accommodation is available closer to Milford Sound, but it's either very expensive, only available to camper vans, or both. So if you are going to be going in a slightly more budget conscious way, or you're not going in a camper van, then it's definitely worth staying in Te Arnau so that you can access Milford Sound. This does come with a caveat, even though it is the closest town, it is still two hours away, so just keep that in mind for your itineraries. Kaikoura is famous for being home to a colony of seals, which is why tourists flock to this city so that they can get an up-close and personal experience with the fur seals. However, don't actually get too up-close and personal with them 
because they will hiss at you. And if they do feel threatened because you get too close, they can bite you and those bites get infected very easily. So I know that it's really tempting because they look so cute and cuddly and innocent, but stay a safe distance away to admire them. While Kaikoura is the major spot to see such seals, then it is worth noting that actually the entire highway that runs up the coastline for probably the best part of about 100 kilometers does also provide you with plenty of stops along the way so that you can take in more fur seals for yourself. Therefore, if you find that there is no parking in the major spots in Kaikoura to see seals, then it is possible that if you take a bit of a longer journey just down the road, you might find another amazing viewpoint to see these beautiful animals. Blenheim is one of the most famous wine regions in New Zealand, and as we mentioned before, New Zealand is especially known for its Sauvignon Blanc, but of course they actually do produce a number of other types of wine that can be enjoyed in this area too. It is definitely worth going and doing some wine tastings at the vineyards, as we would say that this has provided us with some of the best wine tastings we've ever experienced in the world. And we can compare this to the likes of Niagara-on-the-Lake or the Okanagan Valley in BC. The one thing that we learned while we were in Blenheim is that if the winery that you've gone to doesn't offer small bites or have a restaurant, meaning that they don't serve any food, then the wine tasting is actually free. It only costs money to go to a vineyard that does provide some kind of food. And often the wine tasting fees at these places are waived if you purchase a bottle of wine. We finished our time in New Zealand at the main city of Auckland. While a lot of it is accessible by its own internal public transport system, it is worth noting that actually the city as a whole is pretty walkable. However, because Auckland was built on a site of a number of extinct volcanoes, then it means that it's actually very hilly. So if you want to go anywhere, you have to go up a hill. If you want to come home, you still have to go up a hill. So just keep that in mind if you are planning on just walking around Auckland. Speaking of walking, then typically this also means a walking tour for us, and we went with a company that we have also used during our time in Australia. When we were in Sydney and Melbourne, we used this company called I'm Free Walking Tours, and it actually turns out that they have recently expanded into Auckland. We took a tour with them, and it was really, really good, a very comprehensive and professional experience. The only thing to bear in mind is that the frequency of these tours by comparison to the ones in Australia is a bit less because currently it's only a one-man operation. Fingers crossed that it does end up expanding though because it is a great thing to do. Because of the fact that it is limited frequency, then you do have to book ahead of time. So just make sure if you're planning on doing a walking tour with I'm Free in Auckland that you are making sure that you're doing your research ahead of time to make sure you're not disappointed. And that's our list for New Zealand. We hope that our list of tips and tricks have been helpful and that you can apply them to any future travels that you may do. We recognize that this is not a complete list, so if you have any questions or additional recommendations, please leave us a comment below. Until next time though, take care. And keep smiling.